Chapter 58 The Schools of the Prophets The Lord Himself directed the education of Israel. His care was not restricted to their religious interests. Whatever affected their mental or physical well-being was also the subject of divine providence, and came within the sphere of divine law. God had commanded the Hebrews to teach their children His requirements and to make them acquainted with all His dealings with their fathers. This was one of the special duties of every parent, one that was not to be delegated to another. In the place of stranger lips, the loving hearts of the father and mother were to give instruction to their children. Thoughts of God were to be associated with all the events of daily life. The mighty works of God and the deliverance of His people and the promises of the Redeemer to come were to be often recounted in the homes of Israel. And the uses of figures and symbols caused the lessons given to be more firmly fixed in the memory. The great truths of God's providence and of the future life were impressed on the young mind. It was trained to see God alike in the scenes of nature and the words of revelation. The stars of heaven, the trees and flowers of the field, the lofty mountains, the rippling brooks, all spoke of the Creator. The solemn service of sacrifice and worship at the sanctuary and the utterances of the prophets were a revelation of God. Such was the training of Moses in the lowly cabin home in Goshen, of Samuel by the faithful Hannah, of David in the hill dwelling at Bethlehem, of Daniel before the scenes of the captivity separated him from the home of his fathers. Such, too, was the early life of Christ at Nazareth, such the training by which the child Timothy learned from the lips of his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 3, verse 15, The Truths of Holy Writ. Further provision was made for the instruction of the young by the establishment of the schools of the prophets. If a youth desired to search deeper into the truths of the Word of God and to seek wisdom from above, that he might become a teacher in Israel, these schools were open to him. The schools of the prophets were founded by Samuel to serve as a barrier against the widespread corruption, to provide for the moral and spiritual welfare of the youth, and to promote the future prosperity of the nation by furnishing it with men qualified to act in the fear of God as leaders and counselors. In the accomplishment of this object, Samuel gathered companies of young men who were pious, intelligent, and studious. These were called the sons of the prophets. As they communed with God and studied His Word and His works, wisdom from above was added to their natural endowments. The instructors were men not only well versed in divine truth, but those who had themselves enjoyed communion with God and had received the special endowment of His Spirit. They enjoyed the respect and confidence of the people, both for learning and piety. In Samuel's day there were two of these schools, one at Ramah, the home of the prophet, and the other at kirjath Jerim, where the ark then was. Others were established in later times. The pupils of these schools sustained themselves by their own labor in tilling the soil or in some mechanical employment. In Israel this was not thought strange or degrading. Indeed, it was regarded a crime to allow children to grow up in ignorance of useful labor. By the command of God, every child was taught some trade, even though he was to be educated for holy office. Many of the religious teachers supported themselves by manual labor. Even so late as the time of the apostles, Paul and Aquila were no less honored because they earned a livelihood by their trade of tent-making. The chief subjects of study in these schools were the law of God, with the instructions given to Moses, sacred history, sacred music, and poetry. The manner of instruction was far different from that in the theological schools of the present day, from which many students graduate with less real knowledge of God and religious truth than when they entered. In those schools of the olden time, it was the great object of all study to learn the will of God and man's duty toward Him. In the records of sacred history were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. The great truths set forth by the types were brought to view and faith grasped the central object of all that system, the Lamb of God that was to take away the sin of the world. A spirit of devotion was cherished. Not only were students taught the duty of prayer, but they were taught how to pray, 
how to approach their Creator, how to exercise faith in Him, and how to understand and obey the teachings of His Spirit. Sanctified intellects brought forth from the treasure house of God things new and old, and the Spirit of God was manifested in prophecy and sacred song. Music was made to serve a holy purpose, to lift the thoughts to that which is pure, noble, and elevating, and to awaken in the soul devotion and gratitude to God. What a contrast between the ancient custom and the uses to which music is now too often devoted. How many employ this gift to exalt self instead of using it to glorify God? A love for music leads the unwary to unite with world lovers in pleasure gatherings where God has forbidden His children to go. Thus, that which is a great blessing when rightly used becomes one of the most successful agencies by which Satan allures the mind from duty and from contemplation of eternal things. Music forms a part of God's worship in the courts above, and we should endeavor in our songs of praise to approach as nearly as possible to the harmony of the heavenly choirs. The proper training of the voice is an important feature in education and should not be neglected. Singing as a part of religious service is as much an act of worship as is prayer. The heart must feel the spirit of the song to give it right expression. How wide the difference between those schools taught by the prophets of God and our modern institutions of learning. How few schools are to be found that are not governed by the maxims and customs of the world. There is a deplorable lack of proper restraint and judicious discipline. The existing ignorance of God's Word among a people professedly Christian is alarming. Superficial talk, mere sentimentalism, passes for instruction in morals and religion. The justice and mercy of God, the beauty of holiness and the sure reward of right doing, the heinous character of sin and the certainty of its terrible results are not impressed upon the minds of the young. Evil associates are instructing the youth in the ways of crime, dissipation, and licentiousness. Are there not some lessons which the educators of our day might learn with profit from the ancient schools of the Hebrews? He who created man has provided for his development in body and mind and soul. Hence, real success in education depends upon the fidelity with which men carry out the Creator's plan. The true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. In the beginning God created man in his own likeness. He endowed him with noble qualities. His mind was well balanced, and all the powers of his being were harmonious. But the fall and its effects have perverted these gifts. Sin has marred and well-nigh obliterated the image of God in man. It was to restore this that the plan of salvation was devised, and a life of probation was granted to man. To bring him back to the perfection in which he was first created is the great object of life, the object that underlies every other. It is the work of parents and teachers in the education of the youth to cooperate with the divine purpose, and in so doing they are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. All the varied capabilities that men possess of mind and soul and body are given them by God to be so employed as to reach the highest possible degree of excellence. But this cannot be a selfish and exclusive culture, for the character of God whose likeness we are to receive is benevolence and love. Every faculty, every attribute with which the Creator has endowed us is to be employed for His glory and for the uplifting of our fellow men. And in this employment is found its purest, noblest, and happiest exercise. Were this principle given the attention which its importance demands, there would be a radical change in some of the current methods of education. Instead of appealing to pride and selfish ambition, kindling a spirit of emulation, teachers would endeavor to awaken the love for goodness and truth and beauty, to arouse the desire for excellence. The student would seek the development of God's gifts in himself, not to excel others, but to fulfill the purpose of the Creator and to receive His likeness. Instead of being directed to mere earthly standards or being actuated by the desire for self-exaltation, which in itself dwarfs and belittles, 
the mind would be directed to the Creator, to know Him and to become like Him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The great work of life is character building, and a knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education. To impart this knowledge and to mold the character in harmony with it should be the object of the teacher's work. The law of God is a reflection of his character. Hence the psalmist says, All thy commandments are righteousness, and through thy precepts I get understanding. Psalm 119, verses 172 and 104. God has revealed himself to us in his word and in the works of creation. Through the volume of inspiration and the book of nature, we are to obtain a knowledge of God. It is a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is trained to dwell. If occupied with commonplace matters only, it will become dwarfed and enfeebled. If never required to grapple with difficult problems, it will after a time almost lose the power of growth. As an educating power, the Bible is without a rival. In the Word of God the mind finds subject for the deepest thought, the loftiest aspiration. The Bible is the most instructive history that men possess. It came fresh from the fountain of eternal truth, and a divine hand has preserved its purity through all the ages. It lights up the far distant past where human research seeks vainly to penetrate. In God's Word we behold the power that laid the foundation of the earth and that stretched out the heavens. Here only can we find a history of our race unsullied by human prejudice or human pride. Here are recorded the struggles, the defeats, and the victories of the greatest men this world has ever known. Here the great problems of duty and destiny are unfolded. The curtain that separates the visible from the invisible world is lifted, and we behold the conflict of the opposing forces of good and evil from the first entrance of sin to the final triumph of righteousness and truth. And all is but a revelation of the character of God. In the reverent contemplation of the truths presented in His Word, the mind of the student is brought into communion with the infinite mind. Such a study will not only refine and ennoble the character, but it cannot fail to expand and invigorate the mental powers. The teaching of the Bible has a vital bearing upon man's prosperity in all the relations of this life. It unfolds the principles that are the cornerstone of a nation's prosperity principles with which is bound up the well-being of society, and which are the safeguard of the family, principles without which no man can attain usefulness, happiness, and honor in this life, or can hope to secure the future immortal life. There is no position in life, no phase of human experience, for which the teaching of the Bible is not an essential preparation. Studied and obeyed, the Word of God would give to the world men of stronger and more active intellect than will the closest application to all the subjects that human philosophy embraces. It would give men of strength and solidity of character, of keen perception and sound judgment, men who would be an honor to God and a blessing to the world. In the study of the sciences also we are to obtain a knowledge of the Creator. All true science is but an interpretation of the handwriting of God in the material world. Science brings from her research only fresh evidences of the wisdom and power of God. Rightly understood, both the book of nature and the written word make us acquainted with God by teaching us something of the wise and beneficent laws through which He works. The student should be led to see God in all the works of creation, Teachers should copy the example of the great teacher, who from the familiar scenes of nature drew illustrations that simplified his teachings and impressed them more deeply upon the minds of his hearers. The birds caroling in the leafy branches, the flowers of the valley, the lofty trees, the fruitful lands, the springing grain, the barren soil, the setting sun gilding the heavens with its golden beams, all served as means of instruction. He connected the visible works of the Creator with the words of life which He spoke, 
that whenever these objects should be presented to the eyes of his hearers, their thoughts might revert to the lessons of truth he had linked with them. The impress of deity manifest in the pages of Revelation is seen upon the lofty mountains, the fruitful valleys, the broad, deep ocean. The things of nature speak to man of his Creator's love. He has linked us to himself by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. This world is not all sorrow and misery. God is love, is written upon every opening bud, upon the petals of every flower, and upon every spire of grass. Though the curse of sin has caused the earth to bring forth thorns and thistles, there are flowers upon the thistles, and the thorns are hidden by the roses. All things in nature testify to the tender, fatherly care of our God and to His desire to make His children happy. His prohibitions and injunctions are not intended merely to display His authority, but in all that He does, He has the well-being of His children in view. He does not require them to give up anything that it would be for their best interest to retain. The opinion which prevails in some classes of society that religion is not conducive to health or to happiness in this life is one of the most mischievous of errors. The Scripture says, The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23. What man is he that desireth life, and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil, and do good. Seek peace, and pursue it. Psalm 34, verses 12 to 14. The words of wisdom are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Proverbs 4, verse 22. True religion brings man into harmony with the laws of God, physical, mental, and moral. It teaches self-control, serenity, temperance. Religion ennobles the mind, refines the taste, and sanctifies the judgment. It makes the soul a partaker of the purity of heaven. Faith in God's love and overruling providence lightens the burdens of anxiety and care. It fills the heart with joy and contentment in the highest or the lowliest lot. Religion tends directly to promote health, to lengthen life, and to heighten our enjoyment of all its blessings. It opens to the soul a never-failing fountain of happiness. Would that all who have not chosen Christ might realize that He has something vastly better to offer them than they are seeking for themselves. Man is doing the greatest injury and injustice to his own soul when he thinks and acts contrary to the will of God. No real joy can be found in the path forbidden by him who knows what is best and who plans for the good of his creatures. The path of transgression leads to misery and destruction, but wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 17. The physical as well as the religious training practiced in the schools of the Hebrews may be profitably studied. The worth of such training is not appreciated. There is an intimate relation between the mind and the body, and in order to reach a high standard of moral and intellectual attainment, the laws that control our physical being must be heeded. To secure a strong, well-balanced character, both the mental and the physical powers must be exercised and developed. What study can be more important for the young than that which treats of this wonderful organism that God has committed to us and of the laws by which it may be preserved in health? And now, as in the days of Israel, every youth should be instructed in the duties of practical life. Each should acquire a knowledge of some branch of manual labor, by which, if need be, he may obtain a livelihood. This is essential, not only as a safeguard against the vicissitudes of life, but from its bearing upon physical, mental, and moral development. Even if it were certain that one would never need to resort to manual labor for his support, still he should be taught to work. Without physical exercise, no one can have a sound constitution and vigorous health, and the discipline of well-regulated labor is no less essential to the securing of a strong and active mind and a noble character. 
Every student should devote a portion of each day to active labor. Thus habits of industry would be formed and a spirit of self-reliance encouraged, while the youth would be shielded from many evil and degrading practices that are so often the result of idleness. And this is all in keeping with the primary object of education, for in encouraging activity, diligence, and purity, we are coming into harmony with the Creator. Let the youth be led to understand the object of their creation, to honor God and bless their fellow men. Let them see the tender love which the Father in heaven has manifested toward them, and the high destiny for which the discipline of this life is to prepare them, the dignity and honor to which they are called, even to become the sons of God, and thousands would turn with contempt and loathing from the low and selfish aims and the frivolous pleasures that have hitherto engrossed them. They would learn to hate sin and to shun it, not merely from hope of reward or fear of punishment, but from a sense of its inherent baseness, because it would be a degrading of their God-given powers, a stain upon their godlike manhood. God does not bid the youth to be less aspiring. The elements of character that make a man successful and honored among men, the irrepressible desire for some greater good, the indomitable will, the strenuous exertion, the untiring perseverance, are not to be crushed out. By the grace of God, they are to be directed to objects as much higher than mere selfish and temporal interests, as the heavens are higher than the earth. And the education begun in this life will be continued in the life to come. Day by day, the wonderful works of God, the evidences of His wisdom and power in creating and sustaining the universe, the infinite mystery of love and wisdom in the plan of redemption, will open to the mind in new beauty. Eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Even in this life we may catch glimpses of His presence, and may taste the joy of communion with heaven, but the fullness of its joy and blessing will be reached in the hereafter. Eternity alone can reveal the glorious destiny to which man, restored to God's image, may attain.